Okay, we're ready to reconvene our council meeting after a brief recess. And we have an uh, unfinished business item regarding the rezoning application for 508 Helmkin. Uh, the public hearing on this matter was concluded last night and questions uh, to staff and discussion, debate and decision were referred to today's regular council meeting following the City Finance and Services Committee meeting that we just concluded. And we ended that uh, public hearing meeting with uh, the uh, direction that council could send questions to staff uh, for answers to begin this council meeting under unfinished business. Uh, Mr. McNaney, you were the lucky recipient of all of those questions. So we'll begin uh, the item by hearing responses to the questions that came in via email from council. And uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, if there are any follow-up questions to that, we have a round of follow-up questions, and, uh, and then moving from there into uh, discussion and decision. Mr. McNaney. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Kevin McNaney, Assistant Director of Planning. We did receive a number of questions related to planning, housing, and real estate, and we'll answer those in turn from Councillor Carr. Um, first question, why are the two projects, 508 Helmkin and 1099 Richards, not before the public together? Well, there is a financial connection between 508 Helmkin and 1099 Richards. These are two separate proposals, each of which is subject to different regulatory processes. 508 Helmkin is a rezoning, it's the application before you now, and requires council approval following a public hearing. 1099 Richards can be considered under the existing zoning. Increased density for social housing up to 5 FSR and 120 feet can be considered and approved by the Development Permit Board. Under Section 3.13 of the De Downtown Official Development Plan, the DP Board can further consider and conditionally approve a density beyond five for social housing, subject to conditions, including council approval of the bonus density, which you've done this afternoon, and no public hearing is required. The recommended public benefit for 508 Helmkin achieved through CACs is an in-kind contribution of social housing at 1099 Richards. The land exchange between the city and Bren Hill also contributed towards achieving this public benefit. In response to the court ruling, additional information, including various agreements and contracts, has been made available on the city website. In addition, staff are trying to answer any questions about the interrelatedness of the two projects as requests are received from the public and at the time of public hearing. Second question, once rezoned, will 508 Helm can no longer be part of the downtown official development plan? The DODP is structured in such a way that once a site is rezoned to a comprehensive development district, or a CD1, it is automatically removed from the DODP zoning district and no amendments to the DODP are required. <clears throat> Question three, speaker suggested that many buildings are similar height density in the surrounding area. Were all of these rezonings based on the same downtown south guidelines? Most of the buildings in the new Yale Town area were built under the provisions of the DODP. Zoning provisions including bonus density provisions for on-site public benefits in many cases, such as the Vancouver International Film Center, daycares and social housing and they did take into account the downtown south guidelines. When council adopted the policy for a potential benefit capacity in the downtown, more of the development sites have gone through rezoning since that point, including recently 1320 Richards, which is a wall project, 1396 Richards and Ani project, and the mark at 1372 Seymour, also by Ani. In all these cases, the same downtown south guidelines were applied. Finally, uh, can the height or density of the proposal before you today be reduced? Uh, yes, this is a public hearing. It is your judgment on the application. So I'll now ask Ms. Bond to answer the questions relating to housing. Um, Abby Bond, Director of Housing Policy and Projects. Um, so the qu housing questions relate to whether it's true that the only way that the city can achieve social housing without senior government funding is to offer height and density to a developer. And subsequently, is, are there any examples in Vancouver where social housing projects have been or are being developed consistent or very near to consistent with local area plans, density, height? Um, so in response to that, it's, it's fair to say there's not the only way that the city can develop um, social housing. We have a number of tools at our disposal, both the use of city land um, and city grants, both of which show up in the, our capital plans um, on a go-forward basis. We also rely on philanthropic partners like Street to Home. We rely heavily on our provincial partners through their mortgage financing um, and through the grants that they provide. We offer a DCL exemption for social housing. Um, so there are a number of different ways. However, it is fair to say that density is a very important tool 
Um, and it's really about how the construction of the social housing is paid for. In the question, you identified a number of um, examples, both at Victoria and First, and also looking to see whether there were any other examples. Victoria and First was a rezoning, but there was a marginal increase in density. That particular site also required the church to put in the land um, at, at a nominal amount. The city also provided a $260,000 grant, and Street to Home provided a $500,000 grant, and BC Housing put in a $1.3 million grant. So there's a combination. Um, we often see a combination of tools used to make a particular project work. Another example would be 502 Alexander, which you also mentioned, which was Atira's um, container project. Um, and that, again, was done under a development permit, so no additional density over and above um, what was allowed. However, again, what's making that project work is the fact that Atira are taking a mortgage. They're also searching for grants and other philanthropic donors. So while the density doesn't always pay for the construction, it is an important way, a tool that we do use to pay for the construction of social housing. Um, the next question I received was whether we are counting rental units as social housing and are we achieving the needed percent of social housing? Should we be considering the two projects together in order to make this calculation? So the secured market rental units at 508 Hamken are not counted as social housing. We have two different definitions in the DODP, one for secured market rental housing and one for social housing. And those units in 508 Hamken, as proposed, are for secured market housing. The difference being that there's no affordability requirement and also the ownership can be private. Um, as opposed to the units which relate to the 1099 Richards, those have the additional requirement of having an affordability component, plus it must be a non-profit or government owned building. And both of those are also secured, either through a housing agreement or some such other legal agreement as to the satisfaction of the city. Mr. Mayor, Council, with respect to the real estate questions in particular about the 72% of the capture of the land lift, I could refer you to page 21 of the report where we expressly noted that the 25 million um, cash and 1 million cash and the 24 million in kind plus the $7 million for consideration of transferring the risk to the developer Amounted to 32 million, represented 72% of the land lift that we based it on the BC assessment data that's been published. This is a unique situation in, in the fact that we have that data. And as a result, um, that, that's pretty standard across the board for all the rezonings that we have. Typically, we try to aim for 75%, and it's commonly accepted. We cannot speak to what the developer's profit is because the developer incurs all the costs of the, d the development, all the consultants they've hired, the lawyers, all that aspect. In addition, they also face the uncertainty in all the documents that, that have been noted in the land exchange. Um, council's discretion on the rezoning is unfettered, so the developer has taken on that risk. And as a result, that uncertainty is there for the developer. So this is typical of what we do for other rezonings. In addition to that, I do want to point out that there are many benefits that the city achieved that weren't included as part of it. It has allowed, this project would allow the unlocking of approximately $40 million in value, which amounts to a net present value uh, based on our finance calculations of $13.8 million. It is assuring the delivery of, um, sorry, the delivery of 162 units of social housing. It is... Um, also, as I noted, transferring the risk all to the developer in this particular aspect. Um, the next question was, why is there a $7 million development cost escalation? Um, the reason for that is that this is a particular unique element of this transaction, which is after the rezoning, the developer is actually prevented from commencing the construction of the 508 Helmkin site for up to three years. And over that period of time, working with a QS, we did, uh, had advice that cost escalation could be expected in the range of 8%. So in order to provide or get that risk transfer for the city's benefit, 
there was consideration of an extra seven million dollars of cost escalation that's factored in that was a benefit to the city what was the process to sell city land approved by seventy five percent majority of council um, I am a bit careful it was an in-camera decision and in October of 2012 council approved the sale based on the required majority is the city subsidizing the private Montessori daycare by providing the required outdoor play space no there is no legal agreement that we're actually giving exclusive access to the Montessori, Montessori school that's a part that's a tenant of the developer with respect to the park space it is available for the non-exclusive use of all members of the public does that conclude the uh, responses to council questions okay appreciate that uh, report back from staff and we'll now open the floor uh, for council any follow-up questions you have uh, before we move to next steps does anyone have more questions for staff I don't have anyone on the queue, so uh, I'll ask Council for a next step. Uh, Councillor Louie. Are we ready for a motion? I think we are. There's no, uh, no action on the queue for <clears throat> any more questions, so. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, we have a uh, rezoning application before us that has gone through a public hearing process and we are at the latter stages of that process. This is a rezoning process uh, for a piece of land. Uh, the site is 508 Helmington Street. Uh, its request is to move from the downtown district, DD, to a CD1 comprehensive um, rezoning district. And uh, it's important to note this because there's been significant conversation uh, uh, and questions uh, from council and from the delegations that have come and spoke to us in regards to its relationship to existing policy. Uh, this is part of a complex la uh, land exchange between the City of uh, Vancouver and Brent Hill Developments. Council has a number of uh, relevant council policies that it uh, needs to consider. Uh, they are all listed in the report and staff have analyzed these and brought them forward for uh, help to help uh, us remember that these are what helps guide um, staff when considering this this application and um, these are policies of council there was a BC uh, a Supreme Court decision in January 2015 um, the court decision uh, noted some concerns staff had provided more in-depth description of the process behind the land transaction and as well as more information in regards to the key elements of the overall agreement and in response to that uh, court decision what do we what is the application it's uh, for uh, 448 residential units including retail uh, private preschool and kindergarten uh, at grade there are 110 secured market rental units uh, 110 uh, constituting 32 percent of the overall 448 residential units and which is well above the uh, the 30 percent or the 25 percent that's required these are um, secured and a housing agreement. The units are uh, rental for 60 years of the life of the building, whichever is greater. Uh, there is um, under major, major rezonings, family housing is required at 25%. In this instance, 164 units or 37% out of the total units have either two or more bedroom units. Uh, just to note that um, under the under uh, the concept of social housing f uh, in this area the downtown south plan in 1991 there was uh, a target to maintain social housing or low-income housing at uh, 1990 levels around 1600 units and um, there's been some modest modest success there's been an increase of 319 so far but noting that there's still uh, more than 400 aging private sro units that need replacing Of the 162 units that is um, being secured uh, through the funding that's being provided as a result of this particular rezoning, uh, they are secured and operated as social housing. More than half of them uh, meet the DODP definition, uh, which is the 30% uh, uh, at below hills. Uh, in this instance, 53% of them, 87 units, 
will be uh, at uh, or below that that threshold, and uh, they will be reserved for the current units of uh, current residents of Jubilee. The height of the building is uh, approximately 320 feet. Uh, the FSR is 17.9 uh, FSR. Uh, the tower width was of some concern, and uh, staff noted that there are other buildings uh, in the area that are of similar width, and including uh, some just outside the area as well, for instance, Telus Garden. Shadowing is limited. The view cones uh, that, are, that cover the area are being respected and additional design refinement of the and development at this additional design refinement will happen at the development permit stage this is a lead gold building uh, there was significant input uh, over the course of us of council considering this application twice in fact once uh, the initial public hearing uh, process and but the subsequent public uh, hearing process uh, this year in 2015 I would note that there were 9,264 uh, 9, postcards were sent to an addressed ad mail, 7,998 surround to the surrounding property owners. There was website uh, um, information made available. And a um, significant number of delegations came and spoke to us, and uh, new correspondence was given to us as well. You know, it's, uh, it's important for us, uh, I think, that we had that extra opportunity to listen to the public. I, li I know that I listened carefully to the uh, new delegations and, to, and read the pieces of new correspondence and considered them as part of this, uh, this public hearing process. Amounts of DCLs was $6.3 million, uh, public art programs, uh, $651,000. Um, we have had a bit of explanation from um, uh, staff in regards to the CA contribution. So uh, I believe that uh, we're getting good value uh, for money as a result of the negotiations that have occurred. And uh, kudos to our real estate staff for, for being able to do this type of um, analysis and having it confirmed with new numbers of the, as a result of the 2015 assessment. I just want to note, uh, lastly, that uh, this is, I, I think, a uh, an important uh, point that it is a good deal for us, that the, the all development and financial risk for the market rental and social housing will be carried by the developer, that the contribution of the city is capped at $30.6 million, the timing risks and any associated costs related to the, uh, are, are, related, are related to the delay, delays beyond the schedule are carried by the developer, and the city will continue to own the land at 508 Helmutkin until the social housing is built and occupied on Brand Hill site at 1099 Richard Street. And so that outlines what we are get, what are we what we are considering, what we are getting, um, the process that I that we went through, and I um, strongly support this for the various reasons of what uh, I've outlined to you today. Thank you, uh, Councillor Louis. Motion uh, is on the floor, and I've got Councillor Meggs first on the queue to the motion. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll, uh, I'll be supporting this uh, motion as moved by Councillor Louis. It was a, um, it was a powerful experience hearing uh, all of the contributions over the last uh, few days. Uh, this was a uh, obviously very uh, emotional and passionately argued issue in the community. And uh, that was clear to a degree from the submissions we got by mail, many of which were form letters on both sides as far as, you know, understandably people making the same points, both sides of the argument with very similar language. But that uh, fell away when we were here in the public hearing, you could listen to people firsthand and ask them questions. And it was clear that um, there's very strong opinions held on both sides and, and uh, surprising statements to me anyway that I've not heard before in my experience in public hearings threatening legal action and so on um, in from some quarters but in others uh, really laying bare uh, the underlying issues of social housing and and the challenges of trying to create a city that's inclusive uh, while balancing you know community concerns and and all of the other issues that go with city planning I was struck, I guess, uh, when I went and looked at my notes again uh, this morning by the comment by Ellen Clark King from the uh, cathedral who challenged us to um, keep working to make it a green and ethically just city. Uh, green is kind of an environmental reference, but I think ethically just is a very important question here given 
some of the uh, challenges we faced on both sides of this conversation. One, to make sure that we do everything we can to provide housing opportunities for everyone, regardless of their ability. Housing is not something you hope to get. It's something that we should provide as a society to people. And the Jubilee residents really, I thought, dramatized the importance of that, given their long history in the neighborhood. And um, I was struck by the, the comments from Joan Seidel and some of the others that they've you know, notwithstanding the heat that we have, may have felt in this room about some of the issues with regard to the rezoning, uh, feel uh, broadly supported in the community as, as I would hope and expect. And, um, and so that was very reassuring. Uh, I won't belabor all the uh, details that, uh, that Councillor Louie's gone into. I have really thought hard about uh, the efforts made by staff uh, and the developer to push the envelope here to generate something unique on the social housing side. And I think that uh, that is a very worthwhile objective. And, I, and I've thought really carefully about um, what has been necessary to achieve this outcome. And, and I find myself embracing it. And I think that uh, certainly in this latest hearing, we heard the very deep uh, commitment in this community, well beyond the um, residents of Jubilee House, in the wider community, faith communities, neighborhood organizations, people from elsewhere in the city saying that uh, they welcome it, and people in the neighborhood as well. And then I thought hard about the uh, issues that have been raised with regard to the size of the building, its height, and so on. And, and I find myself feeling that uh, while it, it's, um, it's certainly among the largest buildings down there, as someone who doesn't live right there, I feel that it's consistent and in balance with what, uh, what's around it. I don't feel that it is uh, you know, a fundamental violation of, of anything uh, that I see in the neighborhood around it. It's a very successful neighborhood, a vibrant one, and, and I'm pretty confident that this has struck the right balance, that we'll be able to replace this housing, uh, hopefully achieve deeper affordability over time. Uh, but given the situation we face, uh, this is a good solution. I think it's a balanced one, both on the planning side and the social housing side, and I'm happy to support the resolution. Thanks, Councillor Meggs. And next up is Councillor Reimer. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. Um, well, I wanted to start by really thanking the speakers and uh, speakers who came from all perspectives, I think, of the... Um, of the public hearings that I've sat through. This one, as noted by Councillor Meggs, um, had some notably uh, moving and deep issues raised in a way that we don't always see. And I think as a renter, I, I, it spoke to me because I know this issue of security of tenure, um, having a you know precarious housing situation at times um, over the last number of years myself. And that certainly is what I heard from speakers, regardless of whether they were Jubilee House or owners, actually, they felt some level of threat to the security of their housing and in different perspectives being brought to that issue. Um, I have read all the material that we've received on this report that um, came to Council, the report 10912, um, and all the related materials that are referenced in that report, which were uh, quite significant in terms of this. There was a lot of written comments from folks and uh, a lot of subsidiary materials um, to read. Luckily, I. I've had a fair amount of time to sit on my butt and read things lately, so that was helpful. Um, the comments related almost, not exclusively, but they're certainly the weight of the comments fell to whether or not um, there was an appropriate public benefit offered um, in this case. The, it, it is a unique area in the city in that there's no neighborhood plan, maybe not unique, but certainly rare. Um, so I, I have to rely on the context of the Downtown South Public Benefit Strategy, which was last updated in 2007 as my guidance as to whether this is an appropriate benefit. Um, that policy clearly outlines the replacement of social housing in the neighbourhood as a key public benefit, if not in fact, the most important one um, identified in the public benefit strategy. So in that regard, um, it certainly does seem to meet that test. And as Councillor Meg said, um, it, there's a obvious keen uh, desire in the neighborhood to see that met, as well as a clear demonstrated need. There were some comments related to design. Uh, so some comments related to whether the density being offered 
was uh, balanced by the, the public benefit, and I think those have been dealt with through the, the public benefit strategy guidance. Uh, there were some, some more finer grain comments on design that I think are well dealt with through the conditions of approval um, attached to this uh, report. I did want, um, for the sake of given, given the nature of this particular hearing, there were some factual issues I'd want to address um, for the sake of the integrity of the public hearing process. Um, one of the speakers spoke to the social housing definition um, that was passed by council a couple of weeks back and suggested that it had been weakened recently by the removal of specific language and simply to note um, that the staff proposal in the report to that previous public hearing did have specific language that would have done so but in fact it was amended and that exact same language was put back in referencing the programs that the speaker was concerned had been removed so to note that um, that 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 language is there um, there was also some concern that the gunning fall index had been incorrectly used so I did take the time last night and again today to read the instructions which state copy and paste your text into the box below make sure you use complete sentences and then you copy and paste and press calculate I, I did that again for the about us text from the county website and it again came back with a score um, slightly over 24 so I I'm not sure what I'm missing about the two sentences of instructions but um, to note that it, it seems to work in the way that the speaker uh, suggested. Finally, on the issue of the court case and whether or not it's appropriate to consider an issue while a court case, uh, while the appeals in court. I've read the report, heard the city manager's responses, and am quite satisfied that this process is legally undertaken that we are engaged in right now. I would like to say that, um, as Councillor Makes referenced, I'm extremely disappointed by the threats of future court action at a public hearing. I, I one of the speakers um, actually uh, both threatened future court action and noted that um, it is inappropriate in a democracy for decision makers to be threatened by, uh, to be fettered by a threat, regardless of the nature of the threat. I do think the courts are an important um, part of a democracy in terms of settling and resolving um, understandable disputes over um, differences of opinion, but I, I don't think the intention of the courts is to fetter a decision maker in the in the process of carrying out a duty which they believe is being lawfully and in good faith undertaken. So accordingly, I am undertaking this decision um, with an open mind, taking into account the input received in relation to the report in front of us, and we'll be voting in favor of the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Reimer. Next speaker, Councillor Affleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, for me, uh, not much has changed since the last time this came to us, to be honest. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing that's changed is it's, it's torn a, a community apart even further, which is uh, very disappointing because it's a community that I think was uh, very inclusive in, in all its ways. And uh, this project has created a lot of anger on both sides, as we've heard throughout this public, public process. And that's, that's frustrating. Uh, and and, I th and it's disappointing, and I'm, I'm hopeful, hopeful that that will heal after what clearly will probably be the decision tonight, based on what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, I, and, and I think that looking for creative ways as a city to build social housing is is a good thing if we can find ways uh, that make sense that uh, is in the best interest of the entire city. Uh, then that's something that I think we should continue to pursue. In this case, I don't think this is the project that does that. I think that the valuation is off, the CAC valuation is off, and we can argue with whether it's off or on or uh, whether the 25 million is the right number, but I think there's enough evidence and, and the calculations that uh, have been done by the many people as well as uh, you know myself, I think that we're off by at least 50%. I think that, uh, and that means potentially that we're off by 50% on the potential true social housing units we could have developed uh, either in partnership with uh, this proponent or uh, in any other capacity, either with the cash itself uh, and done somewhere else in the city uh, in a building that uh, may be even worse shape than this one uh, that we are replacing with. So I think that's unfortunate and I think it's uh, disappointing and it, it's not something that we should be doing. We should be getting the maximum value on, on a CAC that we can and in this case I don't think we, we had it, we were getting it. I think that it's also disappointing that this project uh, is not only what I believe should be on an expanded park area, 
Uh, and there is no evidence, I know, that uh, shows that we could find that said that that was supposed to be a uh, park expanded, if that ever it was a possibility. But I think you can't argue that it doesn't, it makes sense that that would have been a good place to expand a park. Uh, that is a very busy park. We have a park, uh, a land, uh, and I brought this up on two or three occasions, that we own just a block and a half away uh, that could have been a potential uh, secondary site for any kind of land swap that we could have done with, with the proponent. And I think that might be more uh, in keeping with the neighborhood and more likable to the neighborhood. And I think uh, we would have seen a much more uh, conducive re relationship there because of that. But unfortunately, that wasn't pursued. Uh, the choice of this piece of land would seem to be uh, absolute and without any flexibility. And I find that uh, uh, curious uh, in, in, in that so we couldn't uh, look for some other alternatives. So the, I also think that in general, this, this site, and Councillor Meggs, you said it's not uh, you know, among the largest. It is by far the largest uh, in the neighborhood, twice as large as the next size up in that neighborhood. And it's not only that, it's not so much that. I don't think the neighbors are necessarily uh, against the density. Uh, and, and we've seen that over the last, you know, in my experience, uh, in downtown south, we've had many bu buildings that have uh, been very high in density and only two or three people show up to complain about it. In this case, it was much more than that. So it's not... Uh, the density, I think that was the issue. It's the design and obviously the other issues that I brought up. So the, the podium tower is a Yale Town slash downtown south concept that has been very successful. And this also defies that. It defies the Yale Town look. It will be a large block on a park that doesn't meet the Yale Town uh, downtown south design principles. And I think that's unfortunate and will have an impact on the look and feel of the neighborhood. Uh, and that also is a reason for my uh, misgivings and my desire to, to vote against this. So, you know, and there were other questions that I brought up uh, that were frustrating uh, to staff that I felt I didn't get sufficient answers uh, and surprisingly lack of information that uh, came from staff on my questions and, and that was disappointing. Uh, I appreciate the staff's work on this, but I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. I think there's a lot of issues related to this, this deal and I think we could have done a better job. We should do a better job. And I would encourage you to maybe think about it before you push that button on their computers to vote in favor or against, but you vote against this project with me, because I think we can do a lot better than this for all of the people of this city. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Affleck. Councillor Carr is next. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, may I thank staff um, for your preparation of this uh, report and for answering all the questions. I know I have a lot, and um, it takes time. Uh, for you to prepare those answers. I really appreciate it. It makes a difference to me. It also makes a difference to me, every single person who comes to speak to council, um, because you come with passion, you come with experience and um, uh, knowledge, you're informative, um, and your opinions really matter. Um, Although we're dealing with one project, and we are just one project um, at this decision-making point, 508 Helmkin, we all recognize the, um, there is a link between this and 1099 Richards, um, certainly financially. Um, but I am going to vote on this project, as I did on 1099 Richards, for the project and the merits of the project um, as D-linked, as presented to us. To say, I know there's a link that's there, we all know it's there, but we are presented with one project to vote on. No one can deny the need for more social housing in the city. No one can deny the need that Jubilee House needs to be renewed, needs to be uh, replaced with a new building. That's completely clear. I want to really emphasize that all the residents who came to speak to us from the new t Yale Town Residents Association, the Community Association, not one person denied that need. Every single person made it clear that that need was real and that we as a city need to address it. Um, this proposal enables the building of a new Jubilee House social housing uh, project through the generation of CACs as a result of increasing the density at 508 Helmkin, the project um, about which we are deciding. It is a trade-off. Let's be clear. I mean, everybody knows it's a trade-off. Height and density for money to achieve a social good. So what we need to do is analyze whether or not that, what, whether or not that's a good trade-off, whether or not that makes sense from a policy and a decision-making perspective. 
So one thing that was important to me is to understand, after so many people said uh, to us, the only way we can, um, in the absence of federal and senior uh, government funding, is to, a to achieve social housing, is to do it through this trade-off. It's the only route possible. So I asked staff that question, and the answer is no, it's not the only way to achieve social housing. It is an important way, it is an important factor, and it can absolutely contribute to and um, make certain projects work. But it is not the only way. We have projects in the city by virtue of either faith-based groups or nonprofit groups or outside funding that have achieved social housing. And I think we need to pursue those with incredible diligence and support um, actively um, in the city. We have a BC, uh, sorry, we have a Vancouver Housing Agency um, that can do that. Um, so is it a good deal for the city in and of how it's structured? I looked at the 72% of the increased value of the land lift, which is being garnered as the CACs, which is then being used to pay for the development re, um, of the new Jubilee House. And I, at first I thought it was 72%. Mm, okay, that seems reasonable. And then I reflect back on my experience uh, prior to being elected in a previous life, so to speak, working in the nonprofit world and especially with the forest industry, and realized that that industry counted 20% profit as uh, fantastic. Um, they were, and, and in most industries, when you really look at them, you know, a 28% profit, and when you get a 72%, you know, hold back on the um, on the CACs, that's 28%. That's right off the top profit. That. I have to come to the conclusion, I think we could do better. I don't think it's as good a deal for the city as we could achieve. Um, many speakers ask council to think about the bigger picture, the need for social housing. There's a different bigger picture too, and that is the need to really protect and nurture the city's character, which we do through zoning, through guidelines, through plans, and it, those two are at play in this decision. So the question is, does a trade-off for social housing, is it worth it in terms of the city's character, which is protected through the planning? In this particular case, there is no doubt that 508 Helmkin does not meet the guidelines that protect the city's character. Now, you may think that those guidelines are out of date or that they don't reflect all the towers that are growing up and that's the right way for it to go and maybe we need a new plan in the area or our plan in the area. But the guidelines are there right now. They provide certainty for people, residents, and this project way exceeds any of the guidelines. It's not a big enough site to even go beyond 70 feet or 3.1 FSR. And yet, it is at 320 feet and 17.1 FSR. Some people think that it's okay to have that height. The towers are fine. Others think that maybe only with some moderate increase. I asked these questions. Some think, well, no, these are too tall. They're too tall. They're too dense. Or this is too tall. This is too dense. Um, uh, this is too big. And in terms of our policy, that's the truth. Um, I'm very worried about setting a precedent of ever increasing height and density. Um, that's a dangerous path. There is no, there's no stable ground for people to understand then where and how our city um, will be developed. Councilor so I will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor DiGenova is next. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as the new councilor, I wasn't on council when the major events that brought us here today and decisions were made. This is a very difficult decision for me, um, and we face many difficult decisions here. Uh, there's many people on each side of the issue, and that, that's what makes it so difficult, is I empathize with both sides. I empathize with everyone who takes the time to come out and sit down in our gallery and go through the business that we've all been elected to do. Uh, I certainly don't take this issue lightly. It's something that's very emotional for myself as, uh, you know, I've, I've sat on both sides of, of, of this. I've advocated for social housing. I've also worked in development before. And you know, I understand what Councillor Carr is saying. You can take these projects and look at them separately, but the pro formas, unfortunately, just don't work. Um, considering I did support 1099 Richards earlier today, I have to consider where the funds 
from that are coming from. And that is from the $24 million in CACs that 508 Helmican provides. So it would be irresponsible of me having voted for the project earlier today not to consider that. Ms. Bond answered many of the questions and I won't rattle off the facts that I know Councillor Louie already has done so well. Uh, but at the same time, Jubilee House would not be able to have all of these new units, the 87 units replaced plus 75 units, totaling 162 units, if not for 508 Helmican. I myself working in social housing and trying to secure units, I'm lucky if I can secure six or eight, maybe 10 at a time. 162 is almost unheard of. So if we can do that here at the city, I think that that, you know, that's something that certainly will set a precedence. Uh, perhaps not necessarily with density, uh, perhaps it's not a popular decision, but without the federal and provincial government stepping up, we here as a city have to do something. Mr. Ajla has answered the question about using BC assessment values. And that in this case, uh, with the proponent, it's no different than the other process that other developers face during rezoning. Judy Graves, a former staff member who was with us for many years in her own free time came before us with her wisdom and experience and cautioned us to think about the future and the important role uh, that rezoning and development plays. Our city is not for sale, but at the same time, it's up to us now to provide housing for our most vulnerable citizens. And as I mentioned before, with a lack of funding from the federal and provincial governments, it's up to us. The, the buck stops at us as councillors. So 162 new units at Jubilee uh, House do make a difference. And hearing from you know Joan Seidel and the one the 127 Society, uh, you know, I, I do think that that makes a difference. They have over 200 people on their wait list and they won't even start to, you know, scratch the surface of the amount of people in that neighborhood who need housing. So we've been asked how high is too high, how much density is appropriate. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable with staff's recommendations. That being said, if you ask each person, you'll hear something different. I've sat at hearings and I've heard that a tower is four to six stories tall. I've heard other people say it's 20, 27, whatever that number may be. However, in this neighborhood, I have seen density that, you know, I have seen buildings that are master, that are denser than the building that's proposed here. This is an emotional and I feel for each person, this is not an easy decision for me to make. However, I don't think it's responsible for me to vote for something without having the funds to, uh, to certainly make sure that that's going to be a reality here at the city that wouldn't be fiscally responsible for me. So Ms. Graves' comments struck me as very practical. In the middle of South Vancouver, this project certainly wouldn't work. It wouldn't be right. It would be out of place. I cautiously look at each of these developments differently. And uh, in this case, I feel that we as a city cannot afford to pass up the social housing. And uh, I, thank, I thank everyone, every speaker, every person who sat here in the gallery for hours, every person who emailed us, our staff. Uh, and, you know, I, all, all I will say is I will be supporting this project because I feel that, that it will give us the funds needed uh, to support what we're doing at 1099 Richards. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I too will be uh, supporting uh, this, and it is an emotional uh, issue, and there have been <clears throat> obviously uh, many people who uh, have put in a lot of time thinking and um, discussing and arguing and coming before council and uh, uh, sending us <clears throat> correspondence. Uh, because this is uh, not only uh, difficult, but it's very important. And uh, the need for uh, social housing is extremely important. And I was very struck by Councillor DiGenova's <clears throat> uh, speech just now because she's absolutely right. If we vote in favor earlier, <laughs> how can we not vote now? Because one has to uh, pay for it. Um, I was pleased with the priest, actually, from uh, Christ Church Cathedral, and uh, she's all already been referenced <clears throat> by Councillor Meigs, because I think she laid out 
uh, pretty simply uh, the, the really desperate uh, need and issue we have of, uh, for housing. And I listened to all of the, the speakers who came forward, and yes, I hear almost uh, everyone who's in opposition saying, we love social housing, we want social housing, please give us social housing, but just don't give us this social housing. And I heard those from 127 saying, we, we think that they really don't want social housing. That's the feeling we get now. Uh, who knows, really? But I do think that there are uh, many people who are not happy with the idea of social housing, uh, and uh, we see that time after time uh, that a project comes here, and we have to make a decision and say, okay, but uh, we need the social housing. And this is a huge amount of... Uh, social housing, and not very often do we get opportunities like this. This is a unique situation, and it's been very difficult to staff, for staff to get us to this place, uh, obviously. But I'm, I was uh, also struck by Councillor Affleck saying, I can understand why he's, his rationale for being opposed, I, I don't agree, but I don't understand then turning and saying he's very disappointed with staff. Staff didn't answer all the questions. I thought the staff answered uh, every single question that came forward and kept reiterating points for us. And if there was a need, I mean, I'd like to stop right now and say, Councillor Affleck, why don't you ask staff again what it is you need? Your point of order, Councillor DiGenova. is putting unfortunate words in his mouth. Well, I'm not putting any words in his mouth. He said he was disappointed with staff. And I'm saying I think staff answered every question for you, for everyone on council. Yes, that's certainly my experience. I don't live your experience, Councillor DeGenova. No, not his either. I, we I just uh, be keep, in an argument with a council. Can focused on the, uh, on the matter at hand, please? Thank you very much. So um, uh, I'm, I was particularly pleased with staff on this, uh, this one because there were a, a number of things that uh, were concerning me. And through the questions of others, uh, all of those were answered. And I'm completely satisfied with this. And I'm very pleased that um, it appears that we we're going to go forward, even though there will be some on council in opposition, and I, <clears throat> I know that those at 127 are breathing a sigh of relief right now because there is a desperate need for them to have this, and we have found a way to get it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Ball is next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the councillors that have mentioned everyone who's come to speak to us, and I would I'd like to make it really clear that because someone doesn't like or approve of or think that a particular social housing development is appropriate where it's being put or how it's being funded does not mean that they're not for social housing. And we heard that over and over again, people asking for a development that respected the livability and the character of the neighborhood for everyone. And having worked extensively in a number of social housing developments in New York and to having seen ones that had to be reclaimed or redeveloped because the neighborhood was too dense and unfortunately it resulted in a lot of issues for both the people living in social housing who were crowded and did not have enough amenities to make their lives feel valuable and the people who were around them who felt that the neighborhood was too absolutely unlivable. So I think that people are afraid of losing the livability and the quality that exists. They are not afraid of making sure that people are actually housed. As I said earlier, I don't think there are any villains here. I think, however, there is an enormous amount of confusion. I personally am uncomfortable moving forward while we are still in litigation. 
Uh, and I am not speaking of outside threats. I'm speaking of the litigation that the city itself is engaged in. And I do believe that this will move forward. I do hope that in future we will engage publicly, openly, and amicably with the provincial and the federal government to be able to look at the situation here in Vancouver and indeed uh, in other cities in the, in the metropolitan area so that we can try to work forward without having pressures like this that do tear neighborhoods apart. So unfortunately, I will not be able to vote for this particular project at this time, but I am certainly looking forward to being able to work for more social housing and work with the staff on the innovative tools that they have developed. Thank you, Councillor Ball. And I'm going to speak uh, next uh, to this. Uh, I will be uh, supporting the motion uh, and recommendations um, and appreciate, first and foremost, uh, the speakers and uh, all those who came out. Uh, lots of helpful new uh, information and opinions were shared uh, through this public hearing. Uh, and uh, I think it was a, an important step uh, forward uh, through the, in, the enhanced process uh, to get that much more feedback. It was, um, again, uh, uh, important to have improved the process. I think uh, following the, uh, the uh, guidance that uh, the city gleaned from the court decision, I think improving processes is what we should always be uh, focused on, improving the process and the information provided. Uh, and, and there were good uh, steps made on that front, uh, bringing this uh, back before public hearing, I think with uh, an enhanced process was, uh, was a necessary step, obviously, and uh, I, I give credit to staff for the work that they did to, to continue to improve our process and the information that we share uh, in, in earnest. Um, and that, uh, that improvement needs to continue. I, I think uh, given the growth pressures, uh, the need for a range of housing in the city and uh, the challenges that we face uh, with affordability, uh, we're only going to need to continue to deepen the work that we do with community and to ensure uh, that communities aren't ripped apart. And I, I, I take some umbrage hearing uh, this community ripped apart line being used. Uh, I think we've, we've certainly heard a wide range of opinions. There have been lots of strong opinions expressed, and that's uh, the nature of a city. That is uh, the reality when there are real pressures, and in particular when, uh, when people don't have a place to live, uh, and we are talking about uh, we're talking about uh, a really challenging situation, uh, not just in downtown South, but uh, all over the city, people not having adequate housing. And um, that's something that we grapple with on a daily basis. And, and we, as many councillors have said, do not have adequate support from the provincial and federal government for social or supportive housing, uh, for even uh, a mix of low-income housing that we need in the city for the working poor, those on fixed incomes, uh, that's really disappeared off the table in recent years, and that puts us in the in the challenging position of needing to be a lot more innovative with uh, projects. And it, we heard loud and clear from uh, some uh, eloquent advocacy for uh, social housing and a mix of, of different uh, low-income housing uh, in projects uh, in the city. We. Um, we know this is a top priority of our council, and we heard very compelling uh, opinions and uh, feedback on the conditions that people face uh, in the downtown south, and certainly have for generations, a neighborhood that has always served uh, a low-income community and is increasingly difficult for uh, people on low incomes to live in. Um, so we've, we've got our work cut out for us here, and, and there is no perfect solution to this. I, I know we all wish uh, that, that this were easier, that there were more resources from other orders of government, uh, that, that there was a simpler way to go about this, but uh, th we're faced with these choices. And uh, in this case, I think uh, this uh, is a reasonable next step. I think um, the guidelines that we, we talk about being, uh, uh, being challenged here, I, I think, are just that. They're guidelines, obviously more planning and Engagement on that planning is, is needed in the neighborhood. Um, 
there's still uh, there's still a fair bit of, of growth to do in uh, downtown south in Yale Town, uh, but I think uh, there's every reason to believe we can have some uh, some unique forms. This building will be that on Emory Barnes Park. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, all one type of development and, and does not need to uh, be a fixed line uh, as a guideline, but I think this this project may have a great success in, in being uh, complementary to the neighborhood, to the park, uh, in addition to uh, contributing dramatically for, uh, for the uh, CAC to go into social housing and the great need that we know exists there. So I think there's, uh, there can be real positives flowing from this. I'm thankful for all of the extra work that's been done, uh, the information, the opinions shared, and uh, I, I am optimistic that we're going to see a, a great uh, step forward in the neighborhood and uh, and real progress being made here. And, and that doesn't come easy, doesn't come without some emotion and passion, and uh, I'm thankful for all those who've, who've felt uh, so moved to share that uh, and make sure we do the best we can with this. So thank you. And uh, Councillor Louie. Closing comments. Project, and I appreciate uh, all the comments made by the public and the work uh, that staff put into making sure that we did it uh, right and brought it back before us. Okay. No more uh, speakers to the motion. We will go to the vote. On this item, a motion from Councillor Louie moving the recommendations. And we have our result. The motion carries nine total votes, six in favor, three in opposition. Uh, so we have approved uh, that motion and uh, Concluded on that item and before we move on with the agenda I'll just advise council that uh, under section 2.4 a of the procedure bylaw uh, I will be I'm calling a special council meeting uh, for tomorrow, which is Thursday April the 16th tomorrow afternoon at 4:30, uh, For the purpose of considering the bylaws related to the rezoning of uh, 508 Helmkin Street now that we have concluded that uh, the next step is uh, on uh, the bylaws being considered, and for that purpose, uh, we will have a special council meeting tomorrow afternoon, starting at 4:30, uh, to uh, consider those bylaws um, related to the rezoning that we have just approved. So that uh, there'll be notice of that on the city's website as well, and 